Chapter 7a, Regression Lines and Variables. In this unit, we look at the line of best fit. There are also curves of best fit, but we're going to just do an introduction with lines of best fit. If you take a future statistics class, you'll study curves of best fit more in depth. Those are called curvilinear models. So make sure you read the why, the learning objectives, and our vocabulary. We're going to be talking about linear functions, so they are written in the form of y equals slope times x plus the vertical intercept or the initial value. You might more familiar have seen y equals mx plus b. So in this case, m stands for the slope and b stands for the vertical intercept or initial value. So in example one, we've got three different scatter plots here, and you can see I've started to mark them up because we have three descriptions below, so we want to match the scatter plots with the descriptions. So take a minute and try to do your best matching on your paper, and then you can look back at my matching. So for scatter plot one, I match that to scenario two, where X is measuring the amount of sodium in milligrams per serving, and Y is a consumer report healthy ratings for 10 brands of tomato soup. So a soup with more sodium, I'm assuming, is going to be mostly less healthy. So if we look at this scatter plot here, once we've correctly labeled the x and y axis, it has a downward trend. Scatter plot 2 doesn't have any particular linear trend. And so I think the best fit is if scenario 3, if x is price and y is sodium in milligrams per serving for 10 brands of vegetable soup. We don't expect a relationship between price and sodium, so I'm not surprised to see the kind of random scatter plot here. Scatter plot 3 has a strong positive linear trend, and so I match that to scenario 1, which is city miles per gallon on the x-axis and highway miles per gallon on the y-axis. A car that gets better city mileage is probably also going to get better highway mileage. That would be a car with a smaller motor or a lighter car. So based on the scatter plots, we want to determine if these associations are positive, negative, or neither. If we eyeball fit, we say scatter plot 3 looks pretty positive, scatter plot 1 looks slightly negative, and scatter plot 2 I would say is neither because it's got no pattern to the points there. And so we say the association between city miles per gallon and highway miles per gallon that we chose for scatter plot 3 is positive. The association between the sodium and the consumer reports rating we said is negative because higher sodium is going to have a lower rating. And then we said price and sodium is neither since that scatter plot looks quite random. So now we've got three scatter plots showing body measurements for 34 adults who are physically active. And we want to match each description to scatter plot. And you'll notice. Just overall, the first scatter plot looks like it's a pretty close fit for the line. The second scatter plot looks like the points are mostly random. And the third scatter plot looks like it's a so so fit to a line, but not a perfect line. So, scatter plot one, I matched with scenario one because that has X as the forearm girth and Y as the bicep girth. So, the forearm and the bicep are close to each other in the body, so I would expect there to be a relationship in the measurements there. Scatter plot 2, I match the scenario 3, age on the x-axis and bicep girth on the y-axis. I don't expect there to be a strong relationship between someone's age and their physical size, right? People come in all shapes and sizes once they're adults, right? We're told these are adults, not children, so we don't expect age to have any relationship with the size of the bicep. Scatter plot 3, I match with scenario 2 where the calf girth is the x-axis and the bicep girth is the y-axis. I expect there would be some relationship, but the calf and the bicep are different body parts. It could be someone has um, very muscular calves but doesn't work out their biceps or vice versa. They could have smaller calves and do a lot of weightlifting and have large biceps. So we don't expect a super strong fit there since we're talking about different body parts. So we want to label the associations as strong, fairly strong, or no association. So the association between forearm girth and bicep girth, I said that was a strong positive linear association since they were on the same chart there, or the same body part. 
the association between calf girth and bicep girth, I said that's fairly strong positive. But remember, that was a graph that looked close to the line, but a little bit scattered away from the line in some parts because calf and bicep are on different parts of the body. And then age and bicep girth, we said that had no association. So here in example three, we've got a whole set of different scatter plots and we want to match these to their scenarios. So scatter plot one here, I am matching to scenario three, which is X is measuring years from 1965 and Y is Medicare expenditures. So I expect that Medicare expenditures are increasing and in fact they're increasing even faster than linear here. Scatter plot two, I matched to scenario four. X is the average temperature in Celsius and Y is the average temperature in Fahrenheit. So there's a formula to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit. So I expect that to be a constant relationship. So we think about the linear formula to translate from Celsius to Fahrenheit, that's gonna always keep the points on the same line, right? You're following the same formula every time you convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit. Scatter plot three, I match with scenario one. So X is the months since January. January is the first month. And Y is the rainfall in Napa. So I expect there to be a lot of rain in January and rain in November and December. I don't expect much rain in the summer months in the middle. Scatter plot four, we match with scenario six, where X is the engine displacement in liters, meaning the size of the engine. And Y is the city miles per gallon. So we know cars with bigger engines are going to get worse mileage. So this would be a negative trend. Scatter plot five, we mar match with scenario two. X is the months, again, starting in January. And then Y is the temperature in Boston, Massachusetts. So in Boston, it gets very cold. I think this is the line here through zero. So in January, February, and December, it looks like the average temperature was maybe below freezing um, or very cold in Boston. And then in the middle, in the summer months, we expect higher temperatures. This is not linear, right? Notice it looks parabola shaped, so a linear model would be a bad choice to try to model scatter plot five. Scatter plot six, we match with scenario five, where X is the chest girth and Y is the shoulder girth for a sample of men. So we expect that men with larger chest girths are gonna have larger shoulder girths. It's not perfectly linear, but it's pretty close. So now, example two, we want to interpret these correlations. So we want to look through each scatter plot, and then we're going to try to match it to the correlations below. So the first thing I did is I looked to see if they were positive or negative. So the correlation tells us whether the graph is increasing, and then if it is a strong fit or a weak fit. So a strong fit, positive increasing graph, has a correlation close to one. A strong fit negative slope graph has a correlation close to negative one. And a graph that's just sort of a blob would have a correlation close to zero if the points look random and not particularly linear or, um, or don't have any other clear pattern. So scatter plot one here, I said that's a positive correlation. Scatter plot two is definitely positive correlation. Scatter plot two looks like it would be a perfect correlation of one, and you can check in the table below and see that is. Scatter plot one has a correlation of 0.94, so close to one. Scatter plot three is positive, but it's not a super close fit to a line, so it has a correlation of 0.55. Scatter plot four looks pretty random, so I'd say here there's no correlation, and you can see in the table that scatter plot four had a correlation of 0.01, so almost zero. Doesn't look like there's much of a trend there. Scatter plot five has an overall negative trend, and we see it has a correlation of negative 0.44. So not super strong because it's not that close to negative one, but it's definitely uh, headed in the negative direction. Scatter plot six is also a negative correlation, and it's a little stronger than scatter plot five. So we see it has a correlation of negative 0.88. Scatter plot seven here is a perfect line. It's got a negative slope, so it has a correlation of negative one. 
Notice none of the points stray from the line, so that's what's giving it the perfect fit there. Scatterplot 8 has an overall positive trend, and we see its correlation is 0.75, so close to 1, but not a perfect fit. Scatterplot 9 is a perfect fit, so that's got a correlation of negative 1 since it has a negative slope. And this is where I'm reading the correlation values. Correlations are called R values often. We use the letter R to represent correlation. So the graphs that had positive association were graphs 1, 2, 3, and 8. The graphs that had negative association were 5, 6, 7, and 9. And the graph that looked like it had no association was graph 4. So what does the correlation coefficient tell us? Well, it measures the direction, positive or negative, and the strength of the scatter plot. So is there a largest possible value for r? Yes, the correlation r equals 1 is a perfect fit with a positive slope. And similarly, a correlation r equals negative 1 is a perfect linear fit with a negative slope. So you would never have an r value above or below 1 or negative 1. And then 0 correlation is the smallest value we think about. Um, well, the smallest absolute value, right? That means no association. The smallest value would be the negative one, but we think about it in terms of absolute value. So here's a scatter plot with sugar content per serving on the x-axis and the consumer reports rating on the y-axis for five cereals. So based on the scatter plot, the trend looks kind of negative. So we want to try to estimate the correlation. It looks like a pretty good fit there. So my guess is that the correlation R is negative 0.8 to negative 0.9. And then you can see I labeled a couple of these points from the table. See how there's a point with 3 grams of sugar and a consumer report rating of 50. That's this point up here. And then a point with 3 grams of sugar and a consumer report rating 45. So this is not a function because we've got two inputs with the same output, but overall we see the trend is negative. So this is the formula for correlation. Typically the stat crunch is going to work through it for us. We see it's kind of similar to standard deviation formula. You take x, you subtract the average, and then you divide by the standard deviation of x. So this is the average of just the x's. And then you take the y-coordinate for your point and you subtract the average of the y's and you divide by the standard deviation of the y's. We multiply, sum them up, and then we divide by n minus 1. So for this formula, x represents sugar in grams per serving, and y represents the consumer reports rating. So we want to think about what of these quantities are going to vary and which are going to be different for every cereal. So x is, or which are going to be fixed. So vary, the varying quantities are going to be different for every cereal, and the fixed quantities are going to be the same in the whole equation. So x is going to vary depending on what cereal we have. That's the sugar value for each cereal. x bar, the sample mean, is fixed because that's the mean or the average sugar for all the cereals in the sample. Standard deviation is going to be fixed for x. y itself is going to vary. That's the consumer reports rating for each individual cereal. But y bar is going to be fixed. That's the mean or the average. And the standard deviation of y is also fixed. So we've only got five cereals here, so that's going to make our life a lot easier. And here are some helpful calculations. The mean is four grams of sugar. The standard deviation of the sugar, that's the S with the X subscript, is 3.3. The sample mean for the consumer reports rating is 48. That's Y bar. And the standard deviation for Y is 12.5. So we can see if we work this out for the cereal that has three grams of sugar, and a consumer reports rating of 50, that was the cereal right up here. When we plug that into the formula, we say x minus x bar is 3 minus the average of 4, or the mean of 4. We get negative 1 there. Then we divide that by standard deviation. We get this value, negative 0.303. We do the same calculations for the y's. So the y value is 50 minus the sample mean of 48 gives us 2. Then we divide that by the standard deviation for the y values, we get 0.16, and then we multiply those. So we have to work through this calculation for all of the sugar and consumer report rating pairs, right? So we only had five cereals, thank goodness. So you can see we did it again for the cereal that contains three grams of sugar and a consumer report rating of 45. And remember, these PDFs are linked right below the video, so you can 
you know, open up the PDF and get the values more slowly and match them to your calculation. So if we think about these two points, this 350 cereal is above the Consumer Reports average, but below the average sugar, right? The 50 was above the 48 average, but three was below the Consumer Reports average. And so that calculation, because this was below and this was above, gave us a negative value here. The point 345, the sugar is below the average of four grams of sugar and the consumer reports rating is below the average of 48. So those two negatives multiplied to give us a positive value here. So now some of the calculations I worked out for us here, you can see I wrote in the math that we already did for some of these. So you could work out the missing values over here and check to make sure your calculations match mine. And we should get negative 3.76. We divide by 4 because the formula has got n minus 1 in it. So 5 minus 1 is how we got this 4. And so we end up getting a correlation of negative 0.94. So that's a pretty strong negative correlation. So we estimated negative 0.8 to negative 0.9 correlation. The actual value of negative 0.94 indicates a stronger fit than my eyeball estimate thought. So here's a quick review of linear functions. We write them typically with y as the output, and we can say y equals the slope times x plus the vertical intercept, also called the initial value. You could say y equals the rate times x plus the starting value. In shorthand notation, you might say y equals mx plus b. This is the most familiar way of seeing linear equations written. If the starting point is negative, you'll see y equals mx plus b and subtraction here in the formula. Sometimes you're going to see the formula written with the vertical intercept first and then plus or minus the slope times x. So sometimes the intercept b comes first and then we've got the slope here. That's just fine. So you can write it in either order. So let's look at how we find the line of best fit. So take a minute and pause and read through about Dr. Mildred Trotter and Dr. Goldine Glesser measuring skeletons to try to find formulas to figure out people's height from their bones. So we're going to try to figure out a mystery student. So the mystery student has a forearm measurement of 10 inches, but she's alive and healthy, not like the bones that the doctors were studying. So the height and weight measurements for three female college students are given below, and our task is to try to figure out if the mystery student could be one of these students. So all we know about the mystery student is that she has a forearm measurement of 10 inches. So here is a scatter plot of forearm values on the x-axis measured in inches and height in inches on the y-axis. So this is from 21 female college students in statistics at Los Madonna's College. So what's a reasonable prediction for the height of the mystery student? So I drew that prediction range in here on the graph. So our mystery student has formed 10 inches, so it looks like I think it'd be reasonable to go as low as 62 inches and as high as 68 inches in our estimate. So we're getting that by following the trend of the graph. I didn't do any math calculations, so I'm just eyeball fitting what I think is a reasonable prediction. So we expect variability in data, so we can't determine for sure that any one of these students is a mystery student. But based on this range, could we eliminate any of these students? So if we look back, we've got 5 feet 5 inches, which is 65 inches, 5 feet 2 inches, which is 62 inches, and 6 feet, which is 72 inches. So 62 inches is 5 foot 2 inches, 68 inches is 5 foot 8 inches. We could eliminate the woman who is 6 feet tall, which is 72 inches. So she is outside our prediction range. And I don't think anyone was 5'8 here. I think it was 5'5, five five, which is 65 inches. So I'm not sure why I wrote 5'8. That's my height. So I might have been thinking of myself. So the scatter plot has a positive linear association. And we can see if we fit a line to it, the correlation is 0.68, which is pretty strong. Anything above 0.4 we think of as a strong correlation. So we say, all right, that's a, a pretty good correlation. You can see in your vocabulary section, I gave some specific um, determinations for what we can call strong 
what we can call medium, what we can call very strong. So we want to use our best fit line here to try to predict the height of the mystery student. So see, this is the same scatter plot from the previous page, but the line of best fit is now passing through the points. And we find the line of best fit from a computer by trying to minimize the average distance between all the points. So in our prediction, a height or a forearm of 10 inches matches a height of 66 inches. So that point would be 1066 on the line. So here's the equation of this line. It's saying the predicted height equals 39 plus 2.7 times the forearm length. Or if you want to think about it in terms of x and y, you could say y equals 39 plus 2.7x. Or if you like to see the slope in x at the beginning of the equation, you can say y equals 2.7x plus 39. So we want to use the equation to predict the height of the mystery person. So x equals 10 inches. I plug that in for x in my equation. And it works out to be 66 inches height which is a perfect match for what we plotted on the line, right? Because the line is giving us a prediction. So whether we use the equation or we eyeball it from the line, we should get the same result. So now based on this, what student do you think is the mystery student? So 66 inches is five foot six inches tall. So our closest match is Jane Doe number one. She was five feet five inches tall. So even though Jane Doe number one is not a perfect match, she is the closest match to the line of best fit. So she's our prediction. So we are going to be able to use technology typically to find the equation of the regression line. And we call it the least squares regression line because we square all these distances from the line and then try to find the line that goes through with the least squared distance. So here's the formula for the slope or the rate of change. You take the correlation and you multiply it by the standard deviation of the y's and the standard deviations of the x's. And then the formula for finding the initial value is you take the y mean and subtract it from, or subtract from it the slope or the rate of change times the x mean. So here's a worked example working through that calculation. You can see they know for sodium and the consumer reports rating, the mean sodium, the standard deviation of sodium, the rating, and the mean rating and the mean standard deviation of the consumer reports rating. And then we're told the correlation is negative 0.40. So you see here for negative 0.40, that's going in for the correlation. And then the standard deviation for y is here in the numerator. The standard deviation for x is in the denominator. And so this is how they find the rate of change or the slope. Then the initial value comes from taking the y average, 42.8, and subtracting the slope or the rate of change times the x average and now there's double negatives here so we end up with some addition and we get positive 53.5. So we would say here our equation is that y equals 53.5 plus negative 0 0.067 times x and it's negative because we see the line of s fit has a negative slope here. So you can write your equation with um, y and x, or you can use words. You can say predicted rating because that's what the y value measures, and sodium because that's what the x measures. So in StatCrunch, the first page they give you reports it in terms of words. So see, we've got rating as the y and sodium as the x. But I'll show you in StatCrunch, we can click over and also get the equation in this form from the graph. Also notice in StatCrunch, it tells us R, the correlation coefficient. And then statisticians like to know the square of the correlation coefficient, so that's the r squared right here. So let's look at an example in StatCrunch. So here is a table showing years, the number of boats registered in Florida in thousands, and the number of manatees killed by boats in Florida. So it looks like as the number of boats go up, so do manatee deaths. So we're investigating if there's a correlation between the number of boats and the number of manatee deaths. So which column is going to be the explanatory variable? So we believe that the boats are contributing to manatee deaths. So the number of boats in thousands is the explanatory variable. Which column will be the response variable? The response is the number of manatee deaths, since we believe this is related to there being more boats. So notice here, even though we're given year, that's just a way of kind of enumerating the data. The year, we're not saying the year is the relationship. We're saying we think the boats explain the manatee deaths, not the year. 
So let's go into Stack Crunch and see how we can find the line of best fit. So I've got all my boats data for all those years typed in this column and all the manatees typed in this column. Notice, even though the data for space reasons spans three columns, when you put it in Stack Crunch, you want to combine everything into one column, all the boats in one column, all the manatees in one column. And so we're going to go to Stat. We choose Regression, Simple Linear. And then our x variable is boats, and our y variable is going to be manatees, and we can hit compute. And so the first window looks like that printout we saw in the last question where it tells us the dependent variable, that's the y variable, the independent variable, and then it gives us the equation. So manatees are like y and boats are like x. You can write it with the words like this. Or if you want to see it in terms of x and y, if you click over, the next window gives us a scatter plot in the line of best fit. And if you hover your mouse over, there's the equation. So typically we'll round to four decimal places. If we go back to the previous screen, we see here's a correlation value, 0.94. And then here's the R squared value, which is just the square of the 0 0.9402 gives you right around 0.88. The table also is telling us the estimate for the intercept and the slope. Those are just the values that came up in the equation. And then it gives us the standard error and a lot of other statistical data that we're not going to worry about in this course. If you take an advanced statistics course, you may look more at hypothesis testing with the lines of best fit. So here I've recorded our correlation, 0.94, and our equation I rounded to, it looks like I went to five decimal places. Typically four is a good amount to go to. So now we want to interpret what do the slope and the intercept mean. So the rate of manatee deaths per thousand boats is 0.11769. That's what the slope here is telling us. The slope is always a measure of the rate, and it's the change in the output over the change in the input, or change in y over change in x. What's the intercept telling us? Well, if there were zero, zero boats here, right, zero for x, the equation predicts negative 36 manatee deaths, which doesn't make sense. So sometimes all prediction values don't make sense. If we look back at the line of best fit, we see, oh yeah, we don't start our values until 447. So imagine, oh yeah, if you extended all the way back to zero, you would end up in the negatives. So We'd say, you know, our domain or thinking about these values would probably be 450 to 1,000 or 1,100 boats. So there is a strong correlation because R equals 0.94 is very close to 1, and we know a correlation of 1 is a perfect fit. So do you suspect there's causation between the number of boats and the number of manatee deaths? Can we prove this for certain? So we cannot prove for certain the cause and effect relationship without an experiment. Since it would not be ethical to conduct such an experiment, right, that wouldn't be ethical towards manatees, we suspect a causation and have strong evidence, but we can't say for certain. So remember, realistically, we typically can't do um, experiments in ethical situations like this, so we just rely on data to make conclusions. So we want to use the regression line to extrapolate, which means make a prediction for the number of manatee deaths there would be if there were 1,500,000 boats registered in Florida. So X is the thousands of boats, so we don't need to plug in 1,500,000. We can divide by 1,000, cross out three of those zeros, and plug in X equals 1,500,000, 000, right? A million is a thousand thousands, so 1,500,000 is 1,500 thousands. So we plug that in here for x, work through our formula, and we get 140.25, or approximately 140 manatee deaths. So if Florida ups the number of boat registrations to 1,500,000, 1, we would expect more manatee deaths per year. Here's a reminder from the vocabulary section of how we classify correlations. So 0.4 and above, we say they're strong. When we get to 0.70, we say it's very strong. Um, 0.29 or less, we say is weak. And this 0.30 to 0.39, we can call that a medium correlation. So let's look at another example. 
Here is data from the Congo in Central Africa in 2002 and 2003. A deadly outbreak of the Ebola virus killed 91 of the 95 gorillas in seven different home ranges in the Congo. A group's home range is the region the gorillas and the group travel each day to get food supplies. So the trend in the table looks like as the home ranges increase, so does the number of days until the deaths begin. So we want to check to make sure that we're agreeing on the explanatory variable. So the explanatory variable is home ranges. Further distances take longer for the virus to spread. And then the response variable is the number of days. We expect the distance predicts how long for the virus to spread. So let's go in stack crunch and make a scatter plot and find the line of best fit. So over here in these columns, I've got the number of home ranges and the number of days. So if we go to stat regression, linear regression, we'll get the scatter plot and the equation. If you just make a scatter plot, you won't get the linear regression equation. Our x variable here is the number of home ranges. Our y variable is the number of days. And we click compute. So here we see, here's a formula where the x or the input is the number of home ranges and the output is the number of days. Our sample size was six different um, groups in the table. Our correlation coefficient is 0.96, very strong, and our r squared value is 0.926. And then if we head over here, here's the line of best fit, and we can hover our mouse over to see the formula here. So we record the correlation and the line of best fit here. Remember, the slope is a part that's multiplied by x, so the slope is a 11.2632, and the intercept is the negative 8.0877. So what does the slope mean? So the rate is 11.2632 days for the virus to spread per one home range, right? Remember, the slope and the rate tell us how fast the graph is progressing. And the intercept doesn't make sense because zero home ranges would not be negative eight days to spread. So remember, when we look back at the graph, we want to check and see, well, where do the values start? And here they start at 1. So this scenario wouldn't make sense. And this is a stronger correlation than the Florida boats, since 0.96 equals r is closer to 1 than r equals 0.94. They're both considered very strong correlations. And then do you think there's a causal, causal relationship or causation between the number of home ranges separating the gorilla groups? So without an experiment, we cannot conclude causation for certain, but the strong correlation, remember the correlation is 0.96, very close to 1, indicates there probably is a causal relationship, and the relationship seems to be like a reasonable or related relationship.